Ladies and gentlemen, people of the internet, welcome back to yet another episode of Crypto Over Coffee. I hope you're well. If you're new here, every Friday I break down the latest news and hottest topics in the world of technology and cryptocurrency over a cup of delicious coffee. And today we have Ethereum news to talk about, some Binance shenanigans, Bitcoin price talk, and plenty more. So make sure you stick around until the end of the episode so you don't miss any of that stuff. But like we do in every episode of this show, let's kick it off today with questions from the community on YouTube and Twitter. So I'll head over to the good old iPad and get started with those. And if you want to get some of your questions answered, make sure you leave them in the comments down below or tweet me at Hashoshi4. And if you would be so inclined, please do subscribe to the channel by hitting that little button down there and that little bell notification button next to it so you can get a heads up whenever new content hits the interwebs. More coffee. I'm tired. All right, let's dive into some of these questions here. Now, the first question I've got on the books today is from David Ding. Question about Chainlink. What's the point of the link token? Will it be widely used by everyday people? Thanks. This is a great question. So right now, the link token already has some value to the ecosystem overall. The link token is basically a show of support for what Link is doing, what Chainlink is doing in the market. And they're doing a lot. But I think where it's going and where they're starting to implement is using Link as sort of an, an escrow or an incentive disincentive lever within the ecosystem. So in a world where there are multiple different oracles that serve the same type of data and different contracts on the blockchain or on Ethereum, for example, can request data from those oracles, these contracts can put out sort of like a bid and say, hey, all the data oracles that are out there that can serve this type of data, this is what I need. This Here's the job ID. Give me your best shot, right? And someone can agree to a service level agreement using the Chainlink ecosystem and the bid of link tokens that they put out, this contract is put out, is used as sort of a deposit for the services for data. And on the other side, the Chainlink Oracle side, they put up link tokens as well. And it's like an escrow for both sides to make sure both sides follow and continue and deliver on their end of the bargain, right? So let's just say in an instance where the Chainlink Oracle delivers bad data or doesn't respond, it doesn't complete the job, they'd give up those link tokens, right? They'd be penalized by giving up those link tokens. Let's also say that in a world where you didn't require a link token deposit to get Oracle support for your smart contract, who's gonna force you to pay, right? So it's like a deposit for those services. So I think when Chainlink becomes widely used in enterprise applications and widely used by dApps all over the world, I think we're gonna see the link token being used a whole heck of a lot more. There's definitely a use case. And yes, I think it will be wildly slash widely used by the public. So hopefully that gives you some more information. I have a full deep dive coming out about Chainlink, so make sure you are subscribed so you don't miss that. Next question, CC asks, one question, why are you so excited about coffee? The Italian or Arabic is the best one so far. I actually like Arabica coffee. This particular coffee is actually by a friend of mine, uh, the guy who runs Hotel Fuel. I I'll leave a link down in the description below for you to check out his coffees, but this is a dark roasted coffee. It's quite good and it's in my favorite Dunder Mifflin mug. Do you like The Office? If you like The Office, leave me a quote from your favorite episode down in the comments below. But I just, I love coffee. Honestly, it's one of my favorite drinks. I will drink multiple cups a day. And I just enjoy the meditative process of making coffee. Um, so maybe one day I'll get a coffee sponsor for this show. That would be really, really cool. Uh, and he was just also saying, if you'd like a good trip across the EU, let me know. We could visit a couple places with snow, sun, sunny beaches, and diving. I'm definitely in. As soon as this COVID-19 stuff is over, I'm taking a trip. So I will take you up on that CC. Thank you, sir. Harvey Voss asks, 100% bullish with Link. Could you please advise with me about gaming development on blockchains and what happened with the coffee on this session? That was a video I did, I think an interview with FUD TV. Uh, there was no coffee because I'd already had two cups of coffee and I was already amped. Uh, sorry for the road noise if you can hear that. We're also in the middle of a windstorm here and my house is like shaking from all the wind. So in terms of gaming development on the blockchain, there are a bunch of different platforms that are doing this. 
Uh, I can't even off the top of my head list them all. I really am a fan of Engine. I think there are a bunch of different game development platforms like Unity is an engine I think that has really been trying to implement this and integrate blockchain technologies into it. The difference is, and I was speaking to Elliot about this from FUD TV, is that he's right, the incentive isn't there yet for someone to, as a game developer, to integrate all of these tokens and technologies because ultimately then their recurring revenue opportunities are far less because then P2P sales are possible and no one's gonna buy the hot new item on Fortnite, they're just gonna buy it from someone else, right? So. I think it's gonna, that's gonna be the challenge, but technically with the ERC-1155 token standard on Ethereum, we are getting to the point where it's feasible to do this even in some of these you know, relatively scalable games. Um, but the Loom Network has been working on this, Dapper Labs has been working on games, there's all sorts of things. Check out FUD TV's channel. I'll leave a link about down in the description below for that as well. I think you'll be happy and impressed with the game that he's putting together. I think there's a lot going on there. So gaming, huge use case. I think we're gonna see a lot more. Falk Mattern asks, another question, why would the world switch to this? I see the need for certain cases since censorship resistance is the main advantage here, but the majority of the web is fine how it is right now, isn't it? Who really needs to be censorship resistant? So this was in regards to unstoppable domains and the fact that they recently launched on the Opera Android browser on mobile phones, the ability to reconcile, or sorry, direct to and read from IPFS network websites using unstoppable domains and actually .eth domains as well. So here's the long and short of this. The short answer is that, yes, a lot of the reasons behind unstoppable domains and the websites and things that they're doing are to be more censorship resistant so that your content distributor or your web host can't say, hey, I don't agree with what you're saying, so I'm gonna remove this website from the internet. That happens quite often, and it's not always as simple as you know restricting free speech. Sometimes it's just the simple fact that they change their terms and now your business is no longer allowed to advertise. So I mean, there are platforms out there that I, you know, I've run email lists before, they just don't they just decided one day they don't allow anyone who does affiliate marketing or anyone who does crypto related stuff no one can use their platform and there's nothing that says the domain services and the web hosts can't do the same thing and say hey if you have a website that's about these 10 topics you're gone and just delete your stuff so i think this is just a shift to something that puts you back in control of your content and it creates a more fault tolerant ecosystem too, because it's not just about someone censoring you, it's about being resistant to accidental deletion, being resistant to natural things that happen on networks where servers fail or content gets deleted somewhere. On IPFS, as long as you have seeds and peers that are running your data, you have replication. So if something goes wrong, you have backups and your content is more unstoppable, I guess, pun intended. In that regard, I think Unstoppable Domains is doing a great job of making this technology that already existed more mainstream by integrating it with their Ethereum style domains with .crypto. So I hope that answers your question. I think we're gonna see more and more moving in this direction, like the Ethereum website, ethereum.org is now live as an IPFS website that you can reconcile on Opera. So I think we're gonna see more large businesses doing this and, uh, and starting to experiment with applications hosted on IPFS. Thank you for the question. And Falk Matter, another question I picked up two of yours. Um, is there a difference between .crypto and .zill? Didn't this company start with .zill, which made me believe it's on Zillica? Yes, you're correct. .zill was the original domain project they worked on. They used the Scylla language on the Zillica blockchain to implement their first domains. They launched, they worked, I used it. The issue is in the US especially, it's really hard to get a hand, your hands on Zill tokens and it's really hard to actually use the Zillica product at the moment. So they said, well, what we're gonna do is we're gonna create another project too. We're gonna do .crypto, we're gonna do it on Ethereum where there's a huge developer community and get this stuff used more quickly. And it worked. So they have their domains in, in more people's hands, but both projects still work, both products still work. This isn't like, a, well, we're abandoning the Zillica project. It still runs, I still have a .zill domain and I still use it. Awesome. 
So next question, Speedy asks, is it good with slow internet? And I think he was talking about Brave Browser. Yeah, yeah, this was from Brave Browser video. So this is actually really important right now, especially because people are probably home for the COVID-19 crisis, they're working from home. If you live in an apartment, a tightly packed neighborhood, a townhouse, etc., you're probably online with all your neighbors on one shared internet line. And so the speeds are probably slow, people are running through a lot of content, and I think it's important for people to know this. If you're using a browser like Brave or an ad blocker inside of a browser like Chrome, you're probably going to see some improvements in terms of your performance on your download speeds because you're not gonna be dealing with all that content in the first place, like all the ads downloading, which can actually be quite large in size because a lot of them are videos. So that being said, yes, Brave, especially because it has a natively built and natively integrated ad blocker built with Rust, a really efficient programming language, you're going to see an improvement uh, between Brave with that ad blocker and then one that's like an add-on on Chrome or Vivaldi, etc. So Brave is quite fast. There are a bunch of speed tests online you can look up. I also have one in a video, my video review of Brave from I think last month that I did, there were some speed tests in there comparing common websites you go to and the download speeds were just significantly faster, load speeds. So yes, Brave is a lot faster than the alternatives out there and I think that's one of the main compliments people hear about Brave. Thank you for the question. And then finally, Garden Steam asks, what do you think of Hedera hash graph? I'm concerned about the volume of releases and several glo global companies are on the board. Yeah, I agree. I think Adara Hashgraph was technology that I was very interested in. I think that, that DAGs have a place in this whole space, and I think they're going to be important. That's directed acyclic graphs. Um, but my issue is, is that I think Adara Hashgraph completely just did it. They did an awful job in terms of governance and structuring this as an actual decentralized organization. It, it isn't one. Everyone that's on that board are basically big powers and big names and they have a ton of money and resources, and there's no chance that any small guy, any small company is ever gonna get in into the mix there unless they get really lucky. So I think governance-wise, there's no reason why I'd ever use it because I don't trust that it's, it's basically already cartelized, if that's even a word. It's already been formulated into a non-decentralized organization. So that's a bummer. I hope that they fix it because they probably could at this point if they just opened it up to more people and more organizations. Which DeFi products do you think are the most advanced? Uh, I think Maker, Maker, MakerDAO have a pretty interesting product. It's not perfect. Uh, Kyber is fantastic. Compound, also fantastic. I think though we're just the tip of the iceberg with DeFi. I don't think we've seen anything that's all the way there. And I don't know that we're gonna get there either. We're gonna talk about that more uh, when we talk about Ethereum in this video. But I'm not sure we're ever gonna get to the point where DeFi is massively adopted on Ethereum 1. I think we're gonna need Ethereum 2.0 for that. So more to come on that, hint, hint. Cool, so I think that covers us for the questions for today and we can dive into the news and all that good stuff that you guys are here to listen to. All right, so the first interesting bit of news that I wanted to talk about is some interesting Bitcoin analysis in the wake of COVID-19. The blockchain research firm Chainalysis published a report this week that implied a larger scale shift in the usage pattern of Bitcoin based on some of their findings. For those unfamiliar with Chainalysis though, it's at a super high level, a company that's built an analytics tool that tracks the provenance and usage of Bitcoin using public addresses and in and out points. This report that they created found a distinct weakening of the positive correlation between Bitcoin's price and then the likelihood of users spending their Bitcoin. The higher the price, the more likely people were to spend. Meaning that traditionally as Bitcoin's price dropped, the amount of Bitcoin spending dropped right along with it and by a similar percentage. But during this crisis and the subsequent price drops that we've seen in Bitcoin, the amount of Bitcoin spending has dropped far less than expected. This means a couple of things to me. First, the decoupling of Bitcoin from traditional markets or the fact that it's becoming more uncorrelated, if that's a word, yeah, it's uncorrelation. It's continuing to solidify that fact, that Bitcoin is separating itself more from the prices of other assets and the behaviors that people have within financial crises in traditional markets. 
And then number two, people are starting to see Bitcoin as a means to exchange for goods and services during a period of uncertainty and probably preferring now to transact digitally. And the mindset is not just to hold, 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 hold forever as it really has been largely for the last 10 years. This is really interesting. So I'm really curious, have you spent any Bitcoin during this COVID-19 crisis? And if you have, let me know what you bought, if you're willing to tell me. And let me know in the little card poll above or the comments down below. I'd love to know what you think. Now, today is a special episode of Crypto Over Coffee because it's the very first episode that includes a new segment that I like to call 404 Logic Not Found. In this little firecracker of a segment, I'll be going over notable tech-related fails or otherwise stupid moves that need to get some attention, and I'm going to have some coffee while I do it. This should be fun, and if you like fun, you should probably lightly press that like button. Don't smash it. Lightly press the like button. Like buttons deserve humane treatment, you know. No smashing. Donate now to Pedal, People for Ethical Treatment of Like Buttons. Okay. Sorry, jokes aside, everyone's favorite Craig, Craig Wright, took to his personal blog yet again to decry Bitcoin and make bold claims about why Bitcoin is doomed. But this time he took aim at the Lightning Network and Bitcoin miners in some senses. In this blog post, Craig Wright postulated that the legal system would take significant action against Lightning Channel owners and potentially miners that are transferring or storing Bitcoin that's deemed stolen or illicit on grounds that they're handling stolen goods. He states, and I quote, 2020 marks the year that law comes to Bitcoin and all of the copies. 404, logic not found. First and foremost, this is likely a far less simple legal issue than Craig is making it seem. Digital assets are a whole new ballgame. This is not a baseball card exchange or the movement of precious metals and cash. New laws are going to have to be made or amendments to existing ones are going to have to be made in order to properly enforce rules on cryptocurrencies. I'm not a lawyer and I'm not implying to be one and this is not legal advice, but in my mind, without a clearly standardized way for Lightning Channel owners and miners and even exchanges to identify when Bitcoin is stolen or potentially nefarious via a list, via a registry, via a, a an AI ML platform, I don't know, It's but it's completely unreasonable without those standards, if not impossible to do so without those, right? You have to have standards in place for people to follow or else it's not fair to enforce rules on them. Secondly, it seems like Craig conveniently slipped in and its copies and all its copies at the end of the article where virtually no one would see it. So he has plausible deniability that he was targeting Bitcoin directly. And the truth is that Bitcoin, Bitcoin SV, Bitcoin Cash, and every other cryptocurrency is susceptible to this exact same problem, not just Bitcoin. All cryptocurrencies can and are used for illicit activities. They are stolen and then moved. That's the way it goes. Regulation's gonna come, no doubt and everyone's gonna be affected. You know, Bitcoin SV is pitched as this regulation-friendly crypto, but I'd respond and say, friendly towards what regulations? The regulatory landscape is about as clear as mud after a rainstorm. It's easy to require KYC. It's easy to implement anti-money laundering practices based on the set the standards that are set for financial services industries today. But that's not going to be enough long term, and that's not representative of where we're going in terms of crypto regulation, in my opinion. So overall, this argument doesn't make a lot of sense to me. What do you think? Now, I do have another one for you, and this is another interesting one in the Bitcoin realm. So Mike Novogratz, the Galaxy Digital CEO and renowned Bitcoin bull, has made quite a few bold but totally incorrect Bitcoin price predictions in the past. But this particular statement is quite wild and on the other end of the spectrum. So on April 2nd, Novogratz stated on CNBC that, I quote, this is the year of Bitcoin. And if it doesn't go up now, by the end of the year, I might just hang my spurs, meaning I'll just quit. 404, logic not found. Bitcoin is a long-term play and we can't predict where it's going to go. 
you might as well hang up your spurs right now if you're banking 100% on a new all-time high in the midst of a global financial crisis. No one could have predicted COVID. No one could have predicted that it's going to run right into the halving. And we have no idea what's going to happen. This could be really great for Bitcoin, or it could be quicksand that slows it down in its run to new all-time highs. No one really knows. But to quit on it now, I think would be a giant waste. Just my opinion. Now, in other news, the company behind popular Ethereum game CryptoKitties, uh, a company called Dapper Labs, was just awarded a patent and digital rights, or rights in general, to create tokenized collectibles using the NBA's branding in Brazil. This is yet another high profile example of crypto collectibles hitting it huge in the market. And it's becoming more and more and more evident that the sports industry is going to be a major arbiter of adoption for cryptocurrencies across the board. Dapper Labs, they've already worked on a deal and gotten the rights to UFC branding so they could create crypto collectibles related to mixed martial arts. And now the NBA could be yet another huge opportunity for the company to cement their place as a cornerstone in the non-fungible token space for years to come. I, for one, think that sporting organizations around the world should be all over this potential new revenue opportunity. There's a whole new generation of fans coming through that will love this type of technology, and they're proven to spend money on digital goods all the time on games like Fortnite, the new Animal Crossing game. In-app purchases are huge. Take advantage of it, sporting organizations. It's going to be worth it. Speaking of a new generation, though, I've been reading all over the place online about Gen Z being the first generation to really adopt Bitcoin as they enter the adult world and they start earning themselves. Now, I myself am a millennial, and I was acutely aware of what was happening in 2008 during the financial crisis. Bitcoin in the late 2000s then became a huge fascination to me when I quite literally stumbled upon the white paper in class. It took me a long time to really get it and understand how it worked, what the problems were with the existing monetary system. And the education really wasn't there. I had to go find it. And I still didn't know then how the technology in the world was going to continue to evolve. I was a convert, I guess you could say. I was someone who picked it up and learned about it by accident. However, now Gen Z's and the way they see the world are already 90% there in terms of their approach to what Bitcoin is. It's almost always existed while they've been alive. They're all digital. They prefer to pay on their phones. They grew up almost exclusively in a world where digital money has exist, at least, existed, like in theory at least. And they're currently witnessing a new financial crisis today that could change the way they behave financially in the future. So if I had to guess, between Gen Z and the generation following, Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies will see massive growth in terms of adoption. And I can promise you this much. My kids will be well-versed in the world of Bitcoin and crypto, and they will be using it on a daily basis. So that much I can promise. Now, coffee break. That's really good coffee. In the world of Ethereum, I want to quickly address something I've been considering for a while. And we talked about this a little bit during question and answer. DeFi as we know it, has taken the world by storm, no doubt. With digital loans, flash loans, arbitrage, marketplaces, and all sorts of wild financial services being built on Ethereum using decentralized tech. However, much like the last Ethereum revolution when non-fungible tokens came into the mix with CryptoKitties, we're seeing the scalability issues of Ethereum start to come to the fore, right? There's a limited space in each block for gas and compute resources really just to pay for transactions and subsequently a limit to the number of ERC-20 and Ether transactions that can fit inside one block. Now, as transaction volume increases exponentially, this creates slowdowns and increase, increased fees and other issues with Ethereum. So with DeFi rising in popularity, the increase in these types of transfers has been significant, like 10, 20, 30%. And this type of growth is not sustainable on the existing Ethereum chain. That's just the truth. When CryptoKitties came out, people were obsessed and the non-fungible token contracts were, let's be real, not so efficient. They really still aren't. These transactions of kitties, virtual kitties, crippled the Ethereum network. And it took time to get to a standard that was less intensive, but still heavy, and that's the ERC-721 standard. Now, I fear that the theoretical limits of the Ethereum network are starting to get realized in practice as a result of DeFi's growth, and we'll eventually get there. So if left unabated, the scalability problems could stunt the growth of DeFi 
as the upper bounds, the upper limits of the Ethereum protocol are hit. This is inevitable one day. This whole thing though just proves that Ethereum 2.0 needs to get released to the public this year. If I had to venture a guess, we have about two years before DeFi grows to the point where the Ethereum POW chain, the chain we have today, will not be able to handle it at all. And we'll see more symptoms of congestion long before that. We're probably going to start seeing congestion issues by the end of this year. Now, this is not to say I'm doom and gloom on Ethereum. It's not like I'm giving up on Ethereum. I'm a huge supporter of Ethereum. A lot of my job relies on Ethereum. But I'm also a realist, and I'm seeing the signs of potential issues if Ethereum 2.0 phase zero, not the whole thing, but phase zero is not out in the wild by this summer. Because then DeFi projects that are smart are going to be thinking, do we have to go and look at other protocols? Do we have to go and try something else? But if they know that Ethereum 2.0 is here and it's around the corner and it's coming for real, they might say, hey, we have a runway and we're going to have scalability. Let's stick this out, hang out, and let's try and make this work. So what do you think? Do you think that Ethereum's in trouble? Do you think that DeFi will work out? Comment down below. According to a study done by cyber research firm Barracuda Networks, since the breakout of COVID-19 and the subsequent quarantine, they've found a 667% increase in email phishing scam volume online. Right now, hackers are mobilizing in full force to distribute malware via as many online channels as possible. And they're using phone calls, texts, letters, and all sorts of other means to do this as well. With people expecting to receive emails from their work, from their friends, from services like Skype, Zoom, Netflix, Slack, and all that stuff, the likelihood of someone clicking a link or downloading an attachment without thinking about it has increased like, dramatically. And email is a huge distribution network for malware. And really one for phishing as well. So please be wary of every email that you receive. Verify that it's from someone that you know and check the address twice to verify it came from the person you think it did. Look for minor changes in the domain name, the part that says the name and then .com or .org or .io, etc. Look for things like changing a letter L to a letter capital I. Things that are really hard to catch, but you can see if you look at it. Also, don't download attachments or click links to anything that you don't recognize or that you don't need, regardless of who it's from. You'll never receive an email or a phone call from the IRS saying, hey, give me your social security number and your banking info and we'll send you your stimulus check tomorrow. That's not the way this is going to work. So that's all phishing. So just be mindful of the increased amount of time being spent at home on unsecured networks and all the opportunities that hackers see right now while people are home and just be vigilant. Be careful. And if you have any questions about anything, reach out to me at any time. Now, I do also want to address the latest Binance news really quickly. Many of you probably heard that Binance acquired the top cryptocurrency data site CoinMarketCap for 400 million bucks. My first take here is that honestly, this should make people feel kind of good. This is a huge sum of money for a crypto related website. It shows that crypto is making progress. However, the reality is that Binance is quickly becoming sort of like a cartel entity in this space. Don't get me wrong, before people get mad, I think Binance was instrumental in the 2017 bull run. They've done some amazing work incubating products and helping services get started in the crypto world, but the consolidation of money, power, and now information under one central leadership is a little scary to me. So when people use CoinMarketCap, and there are many, there are troves of data on that website related to those users' interests, what coins people are looking at, and it may be anonymized, but it doesn't matter. Now that information is controlled by Binance, who is an exchange. So there's kind of like a conflict of interest there. From Binance's perspective, they're buying this to buy customers and to buy data to get more customers and to, they're buying insight, which is a smart move. No matter how you look at this, this is a smart move. However, this is how Google took over the world. They started with a clear and good mission, something that was honest, but eventually dedication to success and growth ended up souring the entire mission in the end, which was to give people access to more information and services, right? Binance wants to help crypto grow. It's in their best interest, but I also think they want to be the biggest, most powerful, most wealthy company in the space, and they probably already are up there in terms of that. And I fear that the more power they get, the more information they control, and the more users they bring on, the more the entire mission about crypto being good for everyone is going to get lost. Massive monopolies almost always result in bad stuff. So I hope and pray 
that this doesn't turn into another story of an upstart company that consolidates and dominates and consolidates over again for so long that no one can stand in their wake anymore. If that happens, the ethos of cryptocurrency will be severely damaged. And again, not to be doom and gloom here, but I'm just being 100% honest with you about my fears and concerns about this acquisition. Could it all be nothing? Absolutely. But one big acquisition of a data company doesn't mean they'll become the evil monopoly, but it's best to be wary now than to be wary later when it's too late to do anything. Now, in the enterprise tech world, a company that I'm quite fond of, MongoDB, just launched a huge feature that I've been waiting for for like two years now, and I'm really stoked about it. So MongoDB released field-level encryption for their enterprise database platforms, which means developers can selectively encrypt and decrypt individual data fields within a document for their applications. So if I have a document with username, password, user ID, smart contract address, and all that, I could pick smart contract address and just encrypt that field, and obviously passwords and stuff are encrypted in their own way. This is particularly of interest to me because I often use MongoDB to store off-chain data for blockchain applications that I'm working on. And if I can further secure critical information like indexes to data within a smart contract or smart contract addresses where certain data resides, I can make the security posture better for the end user. This also means that I can keep some data unencumbered by the extra processing of encryption and decryption and do so selectively, which helps performance. So I'm pretty stoked about this feature, and I think MongoDB has done a great job over the last few years bringing really helpful services and features to the mix, and they're one of my favorite tech companies out there today. Now, as always, folks, please do check out some of the previous episodes of Crypto Over Coffee. I'll link them up here on the screen, and I hope that you and your family are doing well, and I hope that you have a great weekend together. Until next time, cheers.